Civil rights laws provide equal, fair, and respectful treatment to all. Eliminate illegal barriers that prevent or deter people from receiving benefits and explain all parties' rights and responsibilities. When working at a partner agency, you have the noble responsibility to ensure clients are treated with respect and dignity. Every positive experience we create while helping people get the food they need moves us one step closer to ending hunger. A warm and helpful environment is the foundation for building trust and community resilience. A protected class is a group of people with a common characteristic who are protected by law from discrimination. The United States Department of Agriculture, which administers federal food assistance programs, recognizes the following protected classes. Race, color, national origin, age, sex, disability, religion, and political affiliation. In addition, the state of Oregon recognizes marital or familial status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and political beliefs. It is against the law to discriminate or to create barriers to service based on one of these protected classes. Food assistance must be open to all individuals regardless of their citizenship or immigration status. Food pantries and congregate meal sites are prohibited from requiring ID, social security numbers, proof of income, or proof of citizenship to receive services. As a network, we recognize that systematic injustices exist. Racism, classism, and sexism create and perpetuate conditions that sustain poverty and hunger. Systematic injustices result from discrimination. Discrimination is the unequal treatment of a person or a group, either intentionally or unintentionally, by neglect or by action or lack of action based on the protected classes. Acts of discrimination can ultimately prevent or deter people from seeking out benefits. A negative experience often results in clients feeling uncomfortable returning for services, creating even more hardships for them, their families, and the community. While serving clients, it's important to be observant of your personal behaviors and the behaviors of others. If you find yourself in a situation that you observe harmful prejudice behavior, it's your responsibility to respond and intervene appropriately. To foster a harmonious environment, it's vital to be thoughtful and constructive about how we encourage each other to change unfavorable behaviors. To address the unfavorable behaviors with compassion in a private or personal setting, consider using the following strategies. Assess what method of communication to use with this particular individual. Mention the specific action and explain why it was discriminatory or offensive. Explain the impacts of their actions and how they can improve in the future. And then report back to the larger group that this specific behavior is unacceptable to prevent it from happening in the future. It's not always easy to stand up for the rights of the people that we serve. If you find yourself unsure of how to handle a difficult or complicated situation, Oregon Food Bank's compliance team is available to provide support. Betty Brown will discuss her experience with remedying a discrimination complaint. Last spring, in March, there was a woman that came to the pantry. There was a man that was working inside the pantry that made fun of um, what she was wearing. She was wearing a hijab, and she just became very, very offended by the comments that were made. The incident happened in March, and I was informed about it in October by one of the individuals from Oregon Food Bank. They told me that a complaint had been launched. And I was so shocked when I heard that and very upset by it that somebody had been treated the way they, this person was treated. I sent an email out that day to all of our leaders and we figured out the person that it was. Then he just started um, volunteering on Tuesday evening. One night when he had come and I was working and I went up to him and I, and I asked him, you know, how he was doing and he, he's very talkative. And so I asked him, did he remember the incident? He, for whatever reason, took it as um, everybody was joking around. He and the person were joking around. And I says, well, yeah, well, she, you know, kind of got hurt and offended by it. And he just totally like, what? So we talked about it. We just talked about differences and and, um, and people wanting to feel accepted and, and things that we think might be a joke to others can become off very offensive. So we talked about it and he got it. Several things have changed. One, the civil rights training. We realized that we can't just do a training once a year. We need to do it more often as volunteers come in. I think that 
the people who who do this type of work do it because they really want to make a difference and our volunteers really want to know that they're touching people significantly and i think it left everybody including me feeling like man we kind of missed it. I got together with the leaders and I said, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Because now we have a group, of, a group of individuals that think that we make fun of this, you know, this people group. And so thank the Lord that we had, we had recently started our free farmer's market thing that we do once a month. And so that totally gave us an opportunity to pass out flyers, to just go out and that's what we did. We went next door and across the street and passed out flyers, and especially next door, we do have a, um, a good amount of that particular community. And so we passed out flyers to them. You know, some people were home, knocked at the door and you know, yeah, you know, here, here's this flyer. We'd love for you to come. We're doing this once a month. Everybody was extremely wonderful. Everybody was really nice. Everybody was just like, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All the people groups you can imagine that were all there, including this particular one. I felt that that showing of those individuals was um, there saying, okay, we're gonna come again. They embrace the opportunity. And I'm so thankful that they did. And I feel like they forgave us for what happened. We are trying really hard to make sure that every person that walks into our pantry feels loved and cared for. Disparate impact refers to practices that adversely affect one group of people of a protected class. Similar to institutional oppression, disparate impacts occurs when policies, practices, rules appear to be equitable, but result in disproportionate impact on a protected group. It's a lot easier to identify intentional discrimination, such as a pantry refusing to serve immigrants, but many people don't realize that discrimination can be subtle. This could be as simple as distributing food in a place, time, or manner that results in denial or limitation of benefits to a protected class. Differential treatment refers to intentional discrimination, such as refusing service or making access difficult because of someone's membership in a protected class. This type of treatment occurs when an individual has negative feelings, thoughts, feelings and attitudes toward a particular group of people. It is important to recognize how personal beliefs, attitudes, and biases can ne negatively impact individuals, families, and groups of people accessing our services. Reprisal or retaliation refers to negative treatment of someone because of a complaint. Examples include creating a hostile environment when the client returns for a service after filing a complaint or spreading rumors about the client after they have complained, or making it difficult for them to get food because you are unhappy that they complained. In general, your goal should be to provide the same experience to all of your clients. However, you are allowed and encouraged to make reasonable accommodations for people with special needs, such as mental or personal disabilities, dietary needs, food allergies, or religious food requirements. If you provide a reasonable accommodation for one individual, you'll need to be prepared to do so for all individuals who express the same need. It is a best practice to write down and visibly post any accommodations made so that all who access your services are aware of its existence. It is critical to train staff of any changes to service models based on available accommodations. Reasonable accommodations ensure that all can access your services in the event that your space or distribution model cannot accommodate their needs, such as helping someone with paperwork or shopping for food. Elizabeth LaPlante will talk about how her food pantry created a reasonable accommodation and ensured all people knew it was available to them. We have one customer, one client, that we always were serving first because he has really bad dementia. And it would take him like an hour to get through the pantry. And then we had a woman want to fill out a civil rights complaint that we were discriminating against her by taking him first. So I reached out for OFB for help in, in that and for language help, for how can we 
implement this in the best way and have it be completely non-discriminatory for folks with disabilities. Oh, I think handing it out to people, right, when you roll it out really matters and having it in all the languages that people need and just really communicating the, the reasons for it to the volunteers and to any clients who ask. I think it's been very, very helpful. A neighborhood House Food Pantry is a shopping style pantry and we really, really try to focus on each client's individual needs. So this is similar to, you know, volunteers rushing to the back to look for meats that uh, someone on a kosher or halal diet can use. Um, this is similar in that we're treating each people as an individual with individual needs and doing our best to accommodate those. I think it really streamlines the getting people served um, because for a lot of the different disabilities it would take them a longer time whether it's a cognitive impairment or mobility issues so getting the you know getting the pantry service front loaded with people who are going to consume more resources really really helps and you can get them in and continue checking everybody else and it really is spread it up. Civil rights laws and regulations prohibit discrimination at all USDA nutrition programs. The main requirements for being compliance with the USDA civil rights include the following. Staff and volunteers interacting with clients or client information and those supervising that activity must complete a civil rights training annually. Watching this video and signing the log completes this requirement. All agencies must have a public notification system to inform participants of distribution hours, their rights and responsibilities, the policy of non-discrimination, and the procedure for filing a complaint. Consult Oregon Food Bank prior to making any changes to the structure of your program or any changes to the days or times your programs offer food. Post the Justice for All and Rights and Responsibilities poster in a conspicuous area. The non-discrimination statement should appear on all materials publicizing your program any flyers, websites, brochures, or newsletters. And please ensure that the text is the same size as the text on the rest of the page. All staff and volunteers are legally required to maintain the confidentiality of client information. Staff and volunteers are often exposed to private information about clients accessing their food program. It is critically important that we respect the privacy of people accessing our services and keep all client information strictly confidential. As a contractual obligation, staff and volunteers are prohibited from sharing client information with anyone, even authorities, unless provided with a court order or a subpoena signed by a judge. Additionally, all records containing client information must be locked in a secure location. Sign-in sheets containing personal information must be kept for three consecutive calendar years. All older records should be destroyed in a secure manner, such as shredding. With our joint commitment to ensuring equitable distribution to our diverse communities, it is essential that we create an environment that is accessible to all populations through having posters, signage, and multimedia in languages represented in the community. A limited English proficiency plan is a worksheet that outlines how we identify, inform, and serve people with limited English in our communities. All partner agencies are required to have an LEP plan and to 1. Keep a copy of the plan on file. 2. Train staff and volunteers on how to implement the plan and use the resources you have available. 3. Review the plan annually to make necessary changes. For example, if you notice Russian-speaking clients have started to come to your pantry and you don't have materials in Russian, your plan should be revised. All required documents from OFB are translated into multiple languages, and if not available in a language needed at your agency, we can get it translated. Paul Davis will discuss how he responds to language barriers at his food pantry. What we discovered at our pantry is that folks who were coming um, spoke uh, Mandarin and spoke Korean, and we needed to figure out how we were going to have a pantry that included them. You know, the way that we discovered how many um, Chinese uh, folks of Chinese background and of Korean background were coming to our program was that we had folks who were coming to our pantry who didn't speak English, and honestly, our community volunteers, nobody really knew 
what language they were speaking. And so um, uh, one of our groups of volunteers was Oregon Episcopal School. And there are some international students there uh, who live in the dorms and they were running our Saturday breakfast. So I invited them. I said, could you come to our uh, pantry, which is on a Thursday, and sort of listen to what everybody's saying and tell us what language they're speaking. And I had told the kids from Oregon Episcopal School, um, I wanna know what people need. Could you find out what people need? And the kids took me very literally and they came back and they said, what they need is this meal and we wanna provide it. Kids from Oregon Episcopal School created what we call Asian brunch. The Asian brunch part has grown to about 100 people gather. That's maybe about 20 students and about 80 elders. The doors open at noon. For us, it's once a month and it's always on the same day. So it's 350 households going through in one day. And nobody spoke the same language. And we, I mean, our elders spoke the same language and our other folks all spoke English. Um, and somehow we pulled it off. And uh, what's happened since then is that we've depended on somebody in the community to be able to speak English and uh, Korean or, and Chinese. If I come to the pantry and I speak English, and I'm talking to other people who speak English, I can sort of, well, I can do a little bar, I'm, I'm not sure what the word is, but I can do a little dickering back and forth. So I really don't want those tomatoes over there. I really don't like tomatoes. But what I'd really like is a couple extra cans of corn. I can do that and I can make eye contact and I can do all of those things that we do to communicate. And in our program, we take very seriously that Oregon Food Bank says be as generous as possible. So the answer for us is always yes. We just have to figure out how to get to yes. If you only speak Mandarin or if you only speak Korean and the person you're talking to only speaks English, then you miss all that subtlety. You miss all of that. And so people become very, very rigid. It's only one, it's only two, it's only this, it's only that. I think equity is how we ought to go. I think compassion is how we ought to go. I think generosity is how we ought to go. All of those things I'd really like our community to be together. There are two main types of complaints, customer service complaints and civil rights complaints. While both are taken very seriously, we do have a more rigorous process for following up on civil rights complaints. Customer service complaints are complaints where a client feels they have been mistreated or had a negative experience, but not because they were a member of one of the protected classes. Clients may also complain about the food that they received from your agency. This is generally also not a civil rights complaint. Civil rights complaints are complaints based on membership in one or more of the protected classes. Both types of complaints can have a negative impact on clients utilizing our services. Therefore, it is important that we be proactive about addressing any complaint that occurs at an agency. Often complaints are about perception. If you can clearly and kindly explain program rules, some complaints can be resolved on their own. Ask the client to identify persons involved by name and position, and clearly explain who did what, why the action occurred, and why they believe the action occurred. There does need to be a written record. If the client refuses to fill out the complaint form, you must do it for them. Clients must also be informed that they can make a complaint directly with the Oregon Department of Human Services. For all civil rights complaints, Oregon Food Bank must receive a copy of the written complaint and the documentation of the follow-up. Please consider using the CLARA method to communicate effectively and empathetically. Step one, calm and center. It's often hard to keep your cool when you're receiving a complaint, but getting impatient or defensive only makes matters worse. It's important to remain calm and centered in order to honestly be engaged during emotionally charged conflicts. Step two, listen. Listening to a person's concern could serve as an opportunity to learn their point of view, hear their questions, and understand their assessments of the services being offered. Listen until you hear the feeling or experience this person is explaining. This allows you to find a way in which you can connect with the person in step three. Step three, affirm. Affirm the concerns of the other person, even if a solution is unclear at the time. Acknowledging and affirming their concerns can allow clients to feel heard, valued, and a sense of belonging. Express the connection you found during step two. Listen. Affirm whatever you can find in their question or statement that represents an issue or real fear. The goal is to convey the message that you are not going to attack or hurt the other person 
and that they have as much integrity as you do. Remember, keep this step genuine and unrehearsed. I find it best to speak spontaneously from the heart. Step four, respond. We often find ourselves wanting to start at this step. After you gather all the information that you need, respond to the concern that the person has raised. If you don't know the answer, say so and refer them to someone who could answer the question. Sometimes it seems that the person does not really want information, but is simply trying to fluster or attack you. Reacting with respect rather than defensiveness or anger is important. It shows respect when a question of this nature is addressed rather than blown off. Remember, personal insights and experiences often reach people in a way that abstract facts do not. The final step is add information. This is your chance to share additional information. New information can help the other person consider the issue in a new light or redirect the discussion in a more positive direction. Take this time to state whatever facts are relevant to the question or comments made. This may involve correcting mistaken facts they mentioned. You can do this now because you have made a hard connection. The person will be more open to hearing your information than they would have been if you started here. Thank you. You have completed the Civil Rights and Confidentiality Training. To verify that all staff and volunteers who have received this training understand and agree to the policies, a log must be maintained at your agency. Additionally, a representative from Oregon Food Bank or from the Department of Human Services will request to see the log during an on-site inspection.